the Code for America Brigade, and I'll be helping to live stream this Open Gov Hack, hack Night. Uh, normally we don't do this, but in case you haven't looked outside, it is snowing a lot. And so we'll be live streaming this. It'll be posted on YouTube later. We'll be getting started in a few minutes. Um, if you know other people who'd be interested, please share the link, and we'll get going. Chris, you want to explain what you're doing? So, I mean, they already do. I was going to do that during the announcement, but I could do that too. Hi, everybody. My name is Christopher Whitaker. I'm the uh, Code for America Brigade captain. Um, I'll be live streaming this since the snow and the trains and the bad transportation day that Chicago is having today. And so, if you see me like doing weird things with the laptop, sorry if that made people dizzy. If <laughs> um, you see me doing weird things with the laptop, that's why. Um, I'll be posting this to YouTube later, so if you want, want to go back and see the cool, awesome presentations again, you'll be able to do that. Cool. All, right. Uh, All right, let's do this thing. Uh, my name is Juan Velez, and uh, welcome to the Open Gov Hack Night. You bring people. You, yeah. You, oh, did someone already make the joke about how you guys have no lives? And, okay. Well, I guess I'll skip that part. Well, we just um, pull up with this evening. Yes, yeah, the sexiest. Um, so, for those who are new, this is a place where we come and uh, hack on some of the data of the city and county and state of Illinois have been releasing, uh, and make useful things with it. If you're confused about how this all works, then you talk to Chris after the break, uh, and myself, and any of the regulars. Um, we usually have a couple guests at the beginning that tell us about the cool shit they're doing, and tonight we have two really good ones. So you chose a good night. Um, and uh, so what we do is we do a little round of introductions, and then we do the, the chats, and then we get some food if we don't have it already, and then we uh, put some projects on the board people are working on, and then we split off. So uh, let's do the introductions thing. Maybe we'll do Sure, that will be an example of brevity for you all. Carl Fogel, open source is my bad. His mouth is full. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, my name is Brandon Willard. I work for Open Plans. I am a statistician. And I work on the bus time project for the here at Open I'm Gideon Bluestein, uh, one of the presenters tonight. I work at the Illinois Department of Employment Security. And uh, I'll be seeing Chris at the break to find out what this is all about. I'm also the founder of a website called Forio, which is a big database of buildings. And I can imagine if you have a only want to come here in that capacity because it's PHO We're a worldwide database. Um, I'm in Chicago. Hey, whoa. Yes. <laughs> you can't us. Well, we know that's open source. We copy. And yeah, you can see pictures, all kinds of data. Um, our aim is to collect all the data possible on buildings, whether it's the number of steps in the staircase, or the materials used in the foundations, or uh, the cost to of admission, or uh, the date that the power frame is dismantled, anything like that. You know, we have um, hundreds of data fields, and we uh, are trying to absorb as best as we can. Awesome. Cool. Are you based in Chicago? Uh, we are. We're based in Chicago. Um, our, my colleagues are all in Europe, but that is what it is here. Cool. You ready to have a okay. Yeah, from home. We were actually um, affiliated before with a uh, website called the Forex. Yeah. You know, you know that? Yeah, well, they, um, they pretty much alienated everybody who belonged to them. All their customers, their uh, editors, their employees, everyone. They so you're a refugee? I'm a refugee, yes, along with um, our programmers, our founder, and our community. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah, my name is John Holtz. I'm with the Open Speed Map. Um, yeah, I'm just new to Chicago and want to little bit contribute to my new neighborhood. I'm Noam. 
And I work for the man, and I'm spending as much volunteer time as I can muster, uh, which is not very much, um, helping out with Civic Lab. The website there is civiclab.us. Um, and like I said, I don't have time to do it all, uh, or even some. So uh, go there and click on the apps for activists or whatever you like. And the guy called Tom is behind that. And um, you can uh, plug you right in. I'm especially trying to do some upgrading with uh, tax increment financing to stuff um, around Chicago. Uh, so talk to me about that. I am uh, Scott Schweisberg, we're at Google, uh, the Google group. Yeah. Uh, Jason Risman, I work with Scott. Hi, my name is Mudir, I'm an experienced designer, I work with RJ. I haven't done anything yet. I'm in the top. I'm to Chicago, I just came here six months back. So I came here to get kind of meet with the tape, learn how I can contribute. Oh, I'm Bo. Uh, I'm an instructor at the Yard Institute of Chicago, and i um, got a couple of city data with a class and we're teaching a project I'm working on right now uh, with a few of you in there. Uh, it's with the Chicago Architecture Foundation. We're um, looking to build a platform that projects on to the, the city model that they have, essentially visualizing live city data as part of an ongoing content mechanism they have there. Um, and that should be getting started actually live in September. So if you have any interest or expertise, uh, I'm talking. Yeah, it's going to be a year long exhibit on the relationship between the city and the data. And the main the kind of showcase is going to be if you've ever been to the CAF, they have this amazing physical model of the loop. And so these guys are thinking about how you could actually project data directly on it to get an interest in urban data or the 3D uh, data viz or any of that stuff. The, the whole point of the exhibit is to actually make it so people can project like, so people can plug into it and actually like use it as a platform. So you know, and we're looking for content and you know, all the really great ideas that we talk about here every week. Um, you know, it's certainly stuff we want to have as content showing what everybody does. Okay, my name's Randy Faxley, um, and I'm an old guy, so I've had several careers uh, in uh, processing and programming geophysical data, uh, applying uh, models to uh, real estate data to price HUD on homes, uh, and then um, real time uh, trading of uh, uh, commodities. Uh, and so forth. And then a lot of other stuff in between, and now I've gotten back into Python and open source and trying to figure all this out. I've basically got my stack, and now I'm looking for projects and how to get them. And uh, also, the uh, Chicago on, on, night, uh, on the night application, I'm the Chicago, kind of threw that out there to see how I did. So he's referring to this uh, competition that the uh, Foundation is doing. Uh, What's it called? Tonight's Challenge yeah. for Open Hub. And they do this every year. They've actually done them a bunch of times this year. This year. And uh, the, the, the theme for this one is Open Hub. So if you have any ideas you want to get to that one, to feed your Strava controller, then this is a way to do it. Maybe if you put Visual Chicago up in the effort in the search box. Is it Visual Chicago? I think that's what I called it. <laughs> this yeah, that's it. Cool. That's me and my wife. <laughs> oh, right here? And oh, that's right here. A, no, that's, that's me up there. That's, that's, the, that's Rom and uh, Superintendent our, McCarthy, right? Our police guy. Yeah. Cool. Because I want to I wanna, I wanna take Gideon's data and the CTA data and the uh, videos and kind of merge them all together so that. Uh, uh, basically, people who are a bit uh, old or decrepit or disabled can easily get around town better. Awesome. Well, we'll be having a breakout group to, to talk about that more. Um, just to keep it all the way. That's cool. Okay. Well, I'm Antonio Arizari. Um, I don't have much uh, um, technical uh, talent, but I'm hoping I can contribute some ideas and grab. 
My name is Will High. I'm a data scientist at ThoughtWorks here in Chicago. Uh, former physicist, I'm interested generally in statistical modeling and processing with Python and R, mapping, um, anything of that nature. My name is Michael Cassell. I'm a student at the University of Chicago. Sociology. <laughs> Uh, hi, I'm Derek Eater. I am the co-organizer of this event uh, with Plot, and I'm also the Open City, and I like to build apps with Open Data. So I'm Gene Linus. I uh, am the founder of Chicago Data Science, which is pretty much me, but I've been doing data science consulting for the last year, and <clears throat> similar consulting for the last, I don't know, 13 years or so. And um, I don't have the courage to call myself a data scientist because it's uh, I call myself a data science consultant, and this, the, the distinction is, is that uh, you know I'm a problem solver, I'm a hack, I use R a lot, um, but boy, it's a tall order to be a data scientist. <laughs> so uh, anyhow, um, that's what I do, and I'm <clears throat> I'm really here to learn. Well, I'm just here to learn. Don't look their fancy methodology. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also here to learn. Hi, I'm Lauren Ellen McCann. Lauren Ellen is my unfortunately long first name. And myself and my colleague John are from the Sunlight Foundation, which is actually based in DC. So we're going to be talking a bit about why we're here shortly. So, yeah. And as she said, John Wunderlich from the Sunlight Foundation. Thrilled to be here and learn a little bit from what you're all doing here. And I'm Simon Drummer. I live and work in the South Side and found out last week that you don't have to be a, 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 like a coder or a programmer to attend the academy. So. It's a common misconception, but yes. Sure. Hi, guys. Uh, I am. My name is Nick Judd, and I'm a different kind of hack. Uh, I'm a journalist. I write for a news site called Tech President, where we cover uh, technology and politics, government, and cinema. And I'm really interested to find out what y'all are doing. I just happen to be in town, so I'm not. Hi, I'm Shimoli. And I have worked as a designer before, but right now I'm studying at IIT, and I'm doing my MSc in Environment Management and Sustainability. So I'm here to learn and contribute as a designer. Now, from primary school, the Art Institute, so I'm going to go out here. I'm kind of a hardware hat guy who is way up here. With the best last name ever. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Douglas Pankos. I'm a professor of architecture at the University of Institute. Uh, my field is data. Projects, inspiration. Okay, a couple of you guys. Hi. Okay, um, so my name is Paul. Uh, let's see, uh, the background is. Uh, <coughs> Uh, graphical models, constrained graphical models. We're at Python and C. Hi, I'm Joe. I'm founder of ProBinder, which is the first comprehensive data directory of Chicago's social safety program. And I love COVID-Gov. And I work across from here until, until like two days ago. Yeah, I'm, I'm, the main, I'm in the main holding pen now. But yeah, <laughs> he's left the fish bowl. <laughs> and now I'm in, yeah, I'm in the fence. The food plates that drop down. <laughs> 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 so inside, he has his own research. Hi, I'm Jason Shank. I'm the director of analytics for the city of Chicago. I'm in uh, the Open Data Portal and, and uh, all the Open Data Initiatives. Uh, I also direct uh, anything data related with the city, from the databases to the advanced analytic platforms that we're trying to build for the city. So, I'm quite good. And he's hiring. Ah, yeah. Is, do we want to do announcements real quick now? Or yeah. and then we'll give him the presentation. So, yeah, I guess Tom can go. You said you have an announcement. Yeah, uh, so uh, a couple of things. Uh, you mind if I throw some up on the Yeah, sure. We got Because there's things. Oh, you want to take uh, just some people next time? Yeah, we have. I don't know if we have the right connector for you. Yeah, this one. Ooh, you got to change my 
There's a reason why I just think it's a bit too much time. <laughs> 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 uh, I support SCSI too. Wow. Yeah, okay. Keep that in mind. <laughs> 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 All right. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't exist. Uh, so just two quick things. Uh, one, I just want to bring up, uh, we're in the final 24 hours of uh, the mayor's challenge and voting for the mayor's challenge. I'm not sure if anybody's heard of this before, but uh, Mayor Bloomberg, his foundation out in New York City, uh, solicited ideas to help improve cities, the quality of life of cities or the efficiency of cities. There was over 300 nominations. They got boiled down to about 12 cities in the end of, that were the finalists. Chicago was one of the finalists. Our idea was a, a predictive analytics platform that can be used in a number of different uh, ways from predicting where they might flood, predicting where issues might have arisen from having a large snowstorm coming in, uh, into a, a number of different ways to build this platform that would involve database technology and analytics open source that to make that available to any city, not just Chicago stuff, but any city to use it to help whatever problems that they may have, big or small, and, uh, and, and to use that as something that we use day to day. Uh, this is a link uh, to, it's bit.ly slash vote shy data. It's a link to this website here, uh, the Mayor's Challenge Finalists. It's a small article by Ron Manuel talking about uh, the benefits of this with a link to actually vote for the various different ideas. So I encourage you uh, to look at all the different entries that you, you've seen across the nation. It's kind of interesting. They have big cities. They have small cities. Chicago's actually the biggest city that is in the finals. There's a lot of mid-sized cities too, uh, such as Louisville and other cities have also made finals. Uh, vote for your favorites, which of course is Chicago. Not with some people so uh, vote for your favorite one. Uh, take a look at the video, but it's interesting to see what we're doing and what everybody else is. The grand prize is $5 million to build the system with four $1 million prizes for the runner ups for the system. You can vote several times, right? Uh, the Chicago one. <laughs> 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 it must be a native. <laughs> That's the Chicago one. <laughs> Another thing we have, we're also hiring uh, in my data science team. Uh, we're actually hiring a data scientist, or a statistician, or however you want to put it. But we're looking for analytics, uh, advanced analytics, so we can take all the data that we have on a day-to-day -day basis and apply that to improve the quality of life of the citizens and businesses, or increase the efficiency of the operations. And of course, that's inclusive, so both counts as well. Uh, just a couple of highlights. Uh, the, Purpose is conducting sophisticated analysis of the city's public and confidential data within the data science team, uh, my team. So this will include data from the portal, but also data that we can't release because it's, it's a bit pretty, such as 911 data, using that data to help improve quality of life or efficiency of the city. And, and, and with that eye on action here, right, it's not just about the statistical formulas, it's not about the advanced evidence, which is important as a ground basis, but this idea of developing an idea, developing policies from the statistical models as a data-informed decision-making. Uh, so the responsibilities is developing the statistical models themselves. So we are taking a look at people who you know, understand sophisticated uh, statistical models. But also, it's not just in an area, right? You're going to be dealing with crime. You're going to be dealing with streets and sand issues. You're going to be dealing with water issues. You're going to be dealing with a broad base of issues that span all of urban ec economics, all of urban planning, all of sociology. It, it's a variety of different areas. We're looking at people that have a broad, a good sense of statistics, but a broad understanding, a broad knowledge in a lot of different areas, or at least the capability of uh, tackling problems in a broad set of areas. Our requirements, we only have actually a bachelor's degree for the requirements and, and about three years of work experience. And that's because there's a lot of, I've met here, in particular, I've met a lot of very bright people that have a bachelor's degree, have some work experience, and, and don't necessarily have a master's or a PhD. I do think that it's probably going to be a master's or a PhD level, just given the, the modeling that we'd be looking for, uh, uh, that we would need. But if you have a bachelor's degree and about three years of experience, uh, we'll be happy to take a look at you. It will go through the process. It gets reviewed by our HR individuals, and it gets uh, uh, bumped over to me if, if you need the initial screen requirements. The uh, short link for that is bit.ly slash shy stats job. Slash shy stat job. So you go there, if you'll see the uh, job posting. Uh, if you feel that you would be a, a great candidate, if you feel that you really contribute to Chicago and you really have that desire, I 
I really encourage you to apply. It's a, it's, it is the most exciting team in government in the United States. It, we, we get to work all facets of data, all facets of data analysis, and we have leadership uh, from Ron Emanuel to Greg Goldstein, my boss, who really invested in data. So it's a fantastic opportunity. So I'll get out of your way. We'll get to the important stuff. So thank you very much. Uh, any other announcements? <laughs> um, I have one, if, uh, if I may. Uh, there's a, a project that uh, Forrest Greg and I have been working on for about uh, a year now. Uh, and we actually just released the alpha version of it last week. Uh, it's a tool called Dedupe. This is an open source deduplication and entity resolution library written in Python. It uses machine learning to basically take a big set of data, could be up millions of rows, and find which, which, which rows refer to the same person or, or entity location, that kind of thing. Uh, and it does it all uh, on your laptop. So we, normally this kind of work, uh, you have to send it out to some major, some big server that, that runs you know, overnight or over several days. Uh, we use some, some cool tricks that we picked up from a couple different places uh, and to basically make this tool. So it's uh, open source. Uh, we are very open to uh, contributors. Uh, and actually, if you just want to try it out, if you have some big, messy data that you want to uh, have uh, cleaned up, uh, then do is maybe a tool for you. So uh, I think Forrest is maybe going to come a little bit later. But if not, um, I'd like to maybe get a group together uh, who's interested in this and we can kind of uh, sort of just like talk about some things and maybe get set up and run it. So, so like, say so you've got some uh, campaign relations data, and you've got a lot of names that are kind of fuzzy, it might be the same person. This would help you pick out those individuals so you can actually make your thing. Another one is, say you've got um, several data sources and you're trying to track the same entities across data sources, like donations and votes and lobbying, for example. This is what, it's what lets you join all these things together without having to like manually to pay a bunch of interns, basically. Because yeah. <laughs> we all know that's what we have. <laughs> so, yeah, if you guys are interested in that, uh, yeah, come, come talk to me. One other quick announcement, if I can. Sure. Uh, the University of Houston Chancellor and President is going to be here on the 14th at uh, McDonald's again uh, to meet with the in uh, Chicago alumni. So, if you guys know the University of Houston alumni, please pass the word along. Any other announcements? Okay, cool. Let's should we get into the presentations? Uh, oh, I have one last one. Sorry to say it twice. Uh, thank you to Code for America for providing the pizza that you are eating. Uh, yay! Yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, and yeah, thanks, thanks to Chris for facilitating that. Um, all right, so yeah, Giddy, you wanna uh, get up there and tell me where to point my browser? Uh, yeah, if you don't mind, go to IllinoisJobLink.com. Start with that. <clears throat> so the extent of my uh, technical experience is that I went to high school with a guy that's on that uh, board up there, Stephen Chen. <laughs> um, but I really appreciate. It. I have I've heard from numerous folks, Derek included, that uh, it's a welcoming group. Uh, that you won't attack me uh, too aggressively <laughs> if I say something stupid or you know I'm sort of a little bit outside of my comfort zone. Um, so I work for the Illinois Department of Employment Security, <clears throat> and I usually start off a speech by asking by a show of hands how many people here have heard of the state's unemployment office? Right, so everybody, how many people here have heard of the state's employment office? Right, a couple of hands. Usually uh, nobody has heard of the state's employment office. And in short, I like to introduce myself as my job is to reverse that so that uh, more people uh, on average will know of our agency as the state's employment office as opposed to the unemployment office. Um, as you may have uh, figured out from our name, we administer the unemployment insurance trust. So uh, if you qualify for unemployment benefits, we're the agency that you interface with to get those benefits. Um, I am not responsible for that aspect of what we do. What I am responsible for um, is basically any part of our agency that interfaces with the business community. And the thing I'm going to spend the most time talking about today is uh, IllinoisJobLink.com, which is the state's labor exchange. Um, so basically, it's just a job board. 
Um, but why does that matter to you guys? Um, well, hopefully we'll find some areas for how it matters and areas where we can work together. The, um, the reason that I sort of wanted to start engaging uh, with this community and, uh, and came out last month to uh, OpenGov Chicago, Yeah. right? Um, I gave a more formal presentation. Uh, it was basically what I want to do. We produce a lot of data, and we keep a lot of data. Um, some of it, which we by law cannot share, uh, because it's uh, individual uh, claimant information, um, their personal information, we can't share that. But in bulk, we can probably share a lot of data in fact, we're tasked with creating a lot of reports and putting them out there publicly, sharing them with the federal government. And so what I wanted to do is basically um, come up in front of you guys, show you, okay, here's what we have. Um, here's where we'd like to get to in terms of service delivery. How can we get there? You guys are the experts. Is this interesting to you? Can we put together a group of people that maybe wants to work on some of this stuff and help me, sort of a neophyte in this area, understand how I can influence not just my agency, but also state government to be a little bit more um, accessible to uh, to your community. So, uh, if you don't mind, Derek, will yeah. you click on resources sure. and go to IJL facts and figures? So this is just kind of a first sampling. Uh, as a job board, we have a lot of information. On average, we have uh, about 120,000 jobs, uh, all Illinois specific. Uh, we have uh, typically about 70 to 80,000 public resumes, so a job seeker is opted to make their resume uh, viewable. As an aside, I would mention if anybody here wants an ego stroke, post your resume up there. Um, as you probably know this, uh, many of you are in uh, fields that are highly sought after and have experience that's highly sought after. Um, I get calls from employers all the time looking for uh, folks with some of the experience that's in this room. So, uh, but seriously, I do encourage you to post up your resume in there and uh, then give me the feedback. Tell me what stunk, what you liked, what you've changed. Um, we do have the ability to make some of uh, the changes uh, to the system. So basically, <clears throat> these are reports that are available in just about real time. Um, if you go to like labor surplus and shortages, you can go either labor surplus or shortage and then search by area. Go ahead and click on it. And then uh, dating back to December 2011 and then up to uh, this current month. What's return man? You did December yeah, 2011 to, to December 2011. Oh, whoops. Pick a more recent month because that might have been. So if I go from here, what if I rolled it up all the way? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Probably. No, it didn't. It was back responses. <laughs> <laughs> so this basically gives you the number of available job seekers in the Chicago Cook area and then the number of available job openings in this time frame. And as you scroll down, it'll show you the different months. Um, so obviously a lot of information based on the state's labor exchange uh, and what's being input into that system. Um, and then there's like eight or nine other categories there that sort of offer like real-time information. The question in my mind that I don't know is like, is this a useful delivery system? Is this, you know, a way that is helpful to you guys? And before I answer questions, I just, I want to show you one other aspect. Go back to uh, where you have the menu on the side. And if you go to resources and then labor market statistics, so this is our uh, labor market information that's produced by our team of economists. Um, we have surveyors that create labor market reports, both for the federal government. Um, and basically, these are uh, some reports that are required by Congress, and then some reports that our, uh, our uh, economists have decided are you know, for a public benefit, so they want to create them. Um, I don't directly oversee that department, but if there were utility in my making a suggestion that we create a certain type of report or put the data out there in a certain way. I could probably get that done as long as it didn't uh, get quashed by our general counsel. Um, so I just wanted to put this up here for you guys to take a look at. A lot of uh, areas, obviously. And then a lot of the stuff, if not all of it, I believe gets posted out to 
data.illinois.gov. And I've heard kind of mixed reviews from different people in terms of the format and how that information is put out there. But I guess, you know, kind of to summarize, my main goal is to show you what I have access to, um, what I have a little bit of influence over, and then basically just start the conversation. Um, the goal, which I didn't state, I apologize, from my mind is really put together kind of a working group of people that maybe can help brainstorm, maybe bring some products um, out I don't want to say to market, but out to the public using this data. And in my mind, the goal is to help people uh, get jobs in a, a more simplified fashion. Uh, I've learned very quickly working at the Department of Employment Security, trying to create a pipeline between job seekers and employers seems like a simple task, but there's a whole lot of um, baloney, I'll edit myself because <laughs> I'm on video, in the middle. Um, I don't know if any of you guys have ever experienced this, but a lot of times when you go to apply for a job that you may have found on a job board, it says, you know, apply through our online system. And it's nearly impossible to ever get through to actually talk to a person. I don't know if I'll be able to solve that problem, but I'd like to engage really smart people like yourselves to see if we can use data to overcome some of those hurdles and come up with some innovative ways to help people's success rate go up when they're looking for jobs. So. That's all I got. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, do we have one of the sit down for questions? Yes. Carl, I think that's Sorry. Awesome. Yeah. I was trying to get out of this. I just wanted to ask um, who who's using the site right now? Like when you look at the website logs and you see who's visiting and where they where they're coming from, what what pages are bouncing on, like who, where do you sense the demand is coming from right now? Um, that's a good question. Um, I'm gonna be honest, I haven't looked at it. It's probably something I should probably analyze. Yeah. There's a couple of things um, that you know seem kind of obvious probably to the general public but are kind of groundbreaking for a state agency to undertake. Um, I'm trying to um, use a little bit of money. As you, as you guys know, digital marketing or digital outreach is not very expensive. And it's kind of like blowing people's minds that I'm trying to use a little bit of money to do that. So I have to make sure that, you know, the general counsel will allow it. But so that's when that kind of information will get really useful so that we can target it. Um, the, oh, that made me think of a general uh, misconception about IllinoisJobLink.com. It's not closed to only unemployment recipients. It's open to the public. Um, one thing Ohio did that I thought was pretty novel, and it's probably too early to talk about doing it in Illinois, but I'd love to look at doing it, is um, they entered into an agreement with Monster.com and started porting in all of Monster's resumes into their state labor exchange. What I learned, another thing I learned very quickly is um, if you have the talent, the businesses will flock. So I was kind of, I came into the job quite honestly thinking, well, my job's going to be going out to businesses and saying, hey, we've got all these people, come use our system. And I think what I've learned is, um, while that is still an important part of it, um, getting more job seekers into the system with a really diverse skill set and really um, sort of breaking that perception that it's just for the unemployed, I think will be a really valuable way to make Illinois JobLink um, sort of on par with you know, commercially usable job boards. Uh, do you know, uh, frustration in the of the job seekers? Like, how many employers have different positions in certain areas and maybe like these cases? Are there you know, what things they come into the same work? Because that's one of those things where I can obviously start looking at why people. What I think that would be really useful information. I'll convey a, f a couple of frustrations from sort of on the job that, that relate to that. So we do a ton of veteran or veteran job fairs. And we have the ability with this uh, system, IllinoisJobLink.com, to basically pre-match um, and try to up the success rate. So, you know, 
employer X is going to be at this veteran job fair, let us know what jobs you're recruiting for. We will scan our system and specifically try to recruit qualified veterans that fit the job description. A lot of the employers won't even give us the job descriptions. So it's like, you know, we're offering you this, you know, no cost service that will up your success rate. And it's hard, sort of, you don't want to get cynical, but um, it is, I guess that's a long way of saying, I think it's an important thing to measure. I'd be worried about uh, the accuracy of the uh, response that we got, perhaps. You're sort of in competition with some other areas with headhunters and just general networking and professional societies and all of that. And when it comes to a lot of this, where you see 4 and 261, I guess these guys over here would say they've got, they've got a lot more than four guys ready to go. But uh, so, so that four is probably low, right? Four is a very low number for architects right now that could go to work. Oh my goodness, yes. <laughs> and, and so you have 261 jobs that are looking for these people, but those guys are putting their resume jobs somewhere else. We, um, one of the best, you said the word competition, and I actually think it's, it's very cooperative with headhunters and staffing agencies. Because the staffing agencies that know about IllinoisJobLink.com love us because it is access to a whole group of uh, potential employees uh, and human resource that they can pull on behalf of uh, the people that they're recruiting for. And that would be another area where, where you might want to run this dude through there. Because I get the same job from six different kinds of head times. Yeah. Okay. Can you go more granular in terms of occupational groups and things like that? Like one thing that might be interesting would be to see, even like part of the reason you're going to have 261 job openings and four job seekers and still no one getting hired is like it might be that there are four engineers and maybe 261 architects or vice versa. Um, so I wonder if there's like additional layers of nuance, maybe even thinking about you know, functional skill sets rather than verbal job types, right? Because like, you know, how like how really different are like the skills that someone's like if someone's looking for someone to do like payroll at a life physical social science company, just payroll at a fishery, like how different is that? Right. So um, some of it is dictated by uh, federal OLNET codes, which are like occupational codes. Um, that being said, the search capability, um, I don't know if this answers your question, but the search capability, so if I'm an employer going in and I want to find a specific uh, group of qualified candidates, I can search by keyword and have uh, all those candidates show up. So I would, if I were looking for a payroll person, no matter what industry, I'd go in and I'd search payroll and probably a, another couple of keywords. Now that I've put you all to sleep. <laughs> okay. Great. So you know, we'll have a little working group, I think, uh, after after other pres presenters. Um, cool. I'd just like to, to throw a little bait out there. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, open Technology Challenge. Uh, so you guys may have heard of this before. It's something that Structure College Collaborative is behind, also the state. Um, essentially, the short is, it's a it's a NAS competition, and one of the prizes is fifteen thousand dollars to work with, build an app that is statewide. And I believe that the data that we just talked about qualifies for that. So if you got an app idea, this is maybe a way to get paid. Right? And as far as I know, I don't know how many people are uh, involved in this yet. Um, so I mean, you might have a really good chance of winning. I'm glad you brought that up, and I would say this: making sure that. We were within the boundaries of the bylaws of this competition. Yeah. I'd be willing to help. You know, if there's more data that's out, you know, whatever right. I can do to right. kind of help if they incentivize people I'm working with. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. So, anyways, we'll have a working group of that um, a little bit later. But I guess uh, we'll move on to our next presenters. Uh, the Sunlight Foundation. Dynasty <laughs> delegates. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so yeah, I think the best website would just be our 
home page. Just the best because, website. Yes, I hope that <laughs> we can look back on this talk when we're here a year from now. We'll actually have a whole presentation to show you, but you're kind of at an interesting start point in the journey that we're going to be discussing. So, John and I are from the Sunlight Foundation. I'm the National Policy Manager and John's the Policy Director. So, yes, there are non technologists who can come to Hackerbase. Um, and Sunlight is based in DC. We're a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization. And for most of our history, we focused on the federal government to kind of give you the backstory to get to why we're here in this room today. Um, back in 2006, almost 2007, our founder, Ellen Miller, was exploring the role that technology was playing in terms of warping what we knew as journalism. And she started talking with other people in this space, and they began to realize that, no, it shouldn't be an award for journalism excellence in terms of using technology to uncover uh, stories about government accountability and increased transparency. We should actually be creating tools and connecting with communities that would allow that to happen on a decentralized level. So over time from that spark of inspiration, Sunlight grew into what it is today, which is a 18-person uh, labs team. Uh, so we employ technologists, and they're awesome, and they don't just sit at their desks like monkeys. They also actually work with our team, which is policy. And we work on a number of different issues, including money and politics, campaign finance, open data, and a whole suite of related issues. Uh, we have a reporting team, which does a fair deal of reporting. And they also train journalists how to use data in their own work to kind of emulate and expand on what we do. We have a communications and operations team, and a really stellar development team as well. Still, though, for most of the time that we've been around, which, as I said, but 2007 was our official out the door, April 26th. Um, we've been looking at the federal government, and it started with Congress, and it kind of creeped a little bit broader. And next thing you know, we're totally deep into the executive branch, and President Obama, and then the uh, government directive happens, and all these things keep happening. But as this is happening, our our view is broadening as well. And last year, we started working explicitly on the international level, um, broadly engaging with other NGOs in our space. And there are many who overlap both explicitly in the technology and the data work, and also in broader norms like legislative monitoring. Uh, we currently work with the National Democratic Institute and a few others in something called openingparliament.org, which is this really amazing coalition of over 100 organizations that are building norms and best practices around legislative monitoring of a parliament or a congress or a state legislature, et cetera. And in 2013, the reason why we are in this room happened, which is that we got a uh, funding from google.org to take on a few new prongs in our work. The biggest, and the reason, again, why we're here, is that Sunlight is looking now at municipal governments um, and local governments with the same lens that we've taken to a lot of our work, but not necessarily restrained just to the campaign finance work that has driven a lot of our notoriety over time and our expertise. So to that end, what are we going to do with the 20,000-something incorporated places in the United States? Great question. Um, and that is why there's no presentation just yet, because this first year is our year of exploration. And that is why we're in Chicago for the next few days. We know that there's a lot of communities already in this space, a lot of actors who are bridging this space. And so our goal is to learn from everybody what's being done and find out what best practices are being set, what sort of projects exist, and, and where the holes are and where the needs are that an organization like Sunlight can actually help out and fill. One thing um, that you might want to bring up, actually, is sunlightcommissioncom slash policy slash open data that is kind of one of the keystones of, of our work from where we were and also where we're going. This is a set of 33 provisions that we made uh, this past summer based on what we were seeing cities passing and states and tidbits from overseas as well in terms of open data legislation and open government more broadly. We realized this is great that some cities and some places have upstart communities that are being really thoughtful about this. There's a whole lot of issues you can think about when you're trying to actually put a policy in place to administer open data and data transparency more broadly. So we tried to break down all of the different things you could be thinking about and then collect best practices and examples. And that's why each of them kind of drops down and they're all hyperlinked. And what we want to do as part of this project, for sure, 
is hack this list. We want to expand it. We want more case studies. We want to learn from the best practices that you guys are even setting. Um, I think from the learning experiences from employment data to lobbying data to everything, we can really improve upon this list. And also educate ourselves based on the processes that people go through just to get the data itself. We're not even talking at the policy level. So that's one thing that we're trying to explore what that actually looks like from our end. Um, we think it's going to be a lot of feedback from the community in terms of sounding back out generalized normative guidance. So I know I keep bringing up lobbying data because I know that's something that you guys have been absolutely wonderful with, with ChicagoLobbyist.org. Um, that's really piqued our interest, not just because of our history in lobbying data, but because of the relationship that Rahm Emanuel had in actually expanding that data and you guys bringing that up as well. And we want to learn how we can tell that story in such a way that it's replicable in other communities, or at least they can find the one thing that's a hurdle for them. So we're going to be hacking on this over time, and I encourage you to be critical, be supportive, find something that you don't think quite fits and get back to us. But we're not married to this list. We really want to think beyond this. And like I said, this first year is really about thinking in many different ways and talking, being a sounding board. And in our second year, we're going to be driving more towards advocacy um, ellipsis as to what exactly that ends up being. But I you know for as far as we're concerned, like I said, this is kind of the, the start of a journey. So if you have feedback, if you have ideas, if you want to nail me down, because I know I'm being as vague as possible and you're being very tolerant, um, I will answer questions and also follow up with us over email. But I just want to say we've been really impressed by what we've been able to peek at through the internet and the community here, and we want to learn from you guys. Yeah. Questions? Anybody? Are you looking to get your answer to particular projects, or more just kind of exploring at this stage? What do you mean by particular projects? Um, well, do you want to help like, look at the TIF data? I don't think they want us to help them. <laughs> <laughs> well, we want to figure out what you need to work better with the TIF data. Okay. And that, if that's an area we can help, we just, so for example, yeah. we haven't just been sitting around for the first two months. Um, we actually just took a very different turn for us, which is looking at municipal bond data. And they're looking at new disclosure requirements, which is our sweet spot, the overlap of disclosure and open data. And dove into this whole, because a, a reporter that we've been discussed, uh, speaking with, to, tipped us off that there were some best practices here that were not being clarified. So we dive in. We're not going to be completely in the wind, and you know it's obviously we want to follow needs, but we're willing to engage granularly, and we're also willing to agree, engage broadly. I know that's like a whole lot. Like I said, this is me from the past, hoping to talk to you again in the future. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it seems like one thing that Sunlight Foundation has been good at, especially with the um, merging of all the 50 states' uh, legislative information, mm -hmm. um, you know, that would be something where it's really hard to imagine, but, you know, whatever the commonalities in are are in the 20,000 heterogeneous municipalities, you know, if there was any kind of standardized API for city data, that would obviously be really appealing. Uh, I don't actually know to what extent this is impossible. It seems like to a large extent possible, right? Because, first of all, you guys have to scale from 50 to 20,000. B, cities are a lot different from each other, too from each other than the states are. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, how do you plan on tackling that if you are, or obviously you don't do all 20,000 cities at once because a lot of them don't have you. Right. Well, that's actually a great point to bring up. Because you have the policy person here, I give you the policy lens. But a big part of this work is actually engaging through our labs team as well, and they're trying to answer that question. So districts are a hot mess in every single state, county, wherever, all over the country. It's very hard to get standards. But we are looking at what would a civic staff look like what are the baby steps we can take towards, I'm not going to use the word standards necessarily, but what it, what would it look like if we were to take open states, which is the um, project of dream? Michael. Michael was just talking about. So just um, as a quick heads up, awesome Illinois is pulled up. Mm -hmm. So this website is in the same vein of um, Open Congress, if you're familiar with that platform, or GovTrack, which scrapes legislative information, makes it searchable, has the votes online, gets the citizens an RSS feed to follow up with bills that are of interest, et cetera. And Open States for the past few years was this um, crowdsourcing project that was like, can we do this at the state level? Can we actually get all of that building and legislative data 
were in wildly different forms and complete disarray and everything was mislabeled. And it turns out if you put three years into it, yes, you can. Um, and so, and uh, a lot of our APIs and stuff are completely free for playing with. So please, if, if this is of interest to you, like go and dig into this stuff. It's all fabulous. And so we're at, trying to add more and more data to open states as it, go along, as it goes along. We just have this big launch. And so this is a massive legislative data, but it also has representative data and um, books when we're able to in a few other fields. And whether we can do this for municipalities is an open question, but we are actually going to be trying to demo that out in a few cities. We haven't chosen them yet, but if you want to give us a good bid or if you're interested in getting involved, that's really great to know. Um, but that's also part of our exploration. I guess I should be saying we're thinking and typing through this time. I have a question. Yeah. So if you had a municipality or like somebody at the municipal level, would you need somebody inside the government or could it be like a citizen collecting the data and then hopping? I understand that. Yeah. That question makes sense. Yeah, so in terms of like actual data collection, I think our approach is that the most sustainable forms of practice has good government allies, good civil society allies, journalists, et cetera. So we want an ecosystem, but I think if there's somebody who's you know, has the, the gumption and the forward thinking and the ability to go and do that and work with them. It really depends case by case because I think there's also like the abstract notion of all the data, which is a kind of ambiguous notion, and then actually liberating specific data sets or working to clean them up. Uh, we're agnostic. It seems to me that one group that we've already talked to them, but one group that this is, I think has sort of a leg up in knowing what the commonalities between different cities are and when it comes up to data is one of the vendors that they all use, which is Socrat. Yeah, right? So yeah. they have dealt with this problem. They've got crime data in San Francisco, in New York, in Chicago, and they're at least aware of like how those things are different. Right? So mm -hmm. I mean, does anybody, can anybody think of another group that has like, no, been doing this stuff? I was going to say the same thing, Socrat. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so they're definitely a similar good group to, to this figure out. I mean, I know there's been efforts, like there's the Yelp data Food inspection standardization project that uh, Code for America was trying to put or has put together to try to ha come up with a standard for uh, food inspections across different cities. Uh, and it's probably a huge challenge. I don't know. Am I off base to say what about the CMAP? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean don't they CMAP? interview a bunch of different. Uh, um, C so CMAP, the, the group in, in, in Chicago? Yeah. And then, yeah, I mean, they take a bunch of data from Illinois and Duke County and the city of Chicago, right? So they they worked on combining those three municipalities together. I thought they did statewide. Um, no, just Chicago. Okay. Just Chicago. Never mind. <laughs> they are, it was, we are a state agency. But right. Like Chicago. But the, the, the example of the food inspection data is a relevant one because it's something that people have already started to look at. It's obviously not that easy to do because some of the cities have very different sort of you know gradations of standards, for example. And what are we going to do? Write a specification and say, oh, uh, by the way, Los Angeles, you know, you've been doing it this way for a long time, and you actually have to do it in New York City. Right. Like why? Right. So, and that's why you said you were afraid to use the word standard. But like, if somebody doesn't start chatting that they have the authority to use the word standard, I don't know, it's going to be a have to a federal level or something. Um, you know, it's hard to imagine. Uh, these things kind of converging successfully. Yeah, maybe you could write like mappers, sort of like you've done in this data, mm -hmm. you know, to make the legislation, make the data from the legislation appear to be having a uniform, you know, inter interface. And obviously, there would be like metadata caveats, like mm -hmm. clients like this. I think it's going to be one of those things where we sort of figure it out ad hoc, subject by subject. I know since the release of the flu shot out. Uh, Philadelphia, Chicago, and a couple of other people have been working to standardize flu shot app or flu shot data where cities have flu shots and for free and distribute those locations to the public. Um, it sounds simple enough, but there's an, sort of an ongoing conversation about how to standardize that. So next flu season when we start deploying flu shot apps, we'll all kind of be singing from the same sheet of music. So what that took was someone to spearhead do it first, right? Right. And then make it easy enough for other people to then reproduce, right? So that's one. 
path, but that's not easy, right? I mean, we built Chicago lobbyists so a year and a half ago, mm -hmm. and no one's like we haven't like you know, we haven't tried to push a standard or anything like that. But you know, we haven't seen other apps in other cities using you know, that same sort of model. Well, I think you're also dealing with the fact that not every city has access to their lobbying information. Sure. Some have better access. So Some like, have better. like San Francisco, for example, has <laughs> more granular data than we do. Mm -hmm. um, and they called us up and asked us to build one for them for free. <laughs> 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 um, but yeah, so I mean, yeah. Um, all right. Um, speaking of San Francisco, I think one example you might want to watch is the way San Francisco, New York, and a couple of other cities are now sharing their restaurant inspection data. Mm -hmm. um, that is a that's interesting to me when we cover the tech president because it's an example of data that's sometimes politically inconvenient. Is that that it angers uh, restaurant owners, and restaurant owners are a very powerful lobby. So there's some political power of uh, act operating against disclosure, and disclosure is happening anyway. So that's interesting. That I think is worth exploring. Mm -hmm. There was a company called Thompson that uh, works with all kinds of things, corporations and vendors. And would this go to the level of saying buying a soft truck and and the bid that's being put out for that? We're, we are very interested in looking at open contracting and procurement information at the municipal level, too. So, yes, I guess. Yeah, the city releases contract data. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's, got, it's, it's a flat file, and so you see things like subcontractor 1 address, subcontractor 14 address. Right. Like it goes all the way on. There's like no standardization for that, too. Well, I think that's a, that's an important when we're talking about standards because that's another thing when we think about what our ability to like support broad efforts are. Right? We're not going we don't have paratroopers that can come in and be like, clean your data, next city. Um, Just wait twenty years. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's our third year out. But you know what we can do is start articulating if you're going to be releasing this information, we can, we can get into foreign fields that need to be present when you start releasing. But the other thing that we want to make sure that we're able to reflect as well is that this isn't open data isn't just for the top 25 cities in the US. We also want to start thinking about, you know, a municipality as an incorporated place is also a town and a county. And those are often getting ignored in these scenarios. And I'm not saying that Chicago is done because you're here and you guys are brilliant, but I am saying that, you know, my hometown, which is a 8,000 person place in Connecticut, um, is kind of crickets at this point, but they have a website, they have some people inside that are interested in this, and they figured out how to live stream their public meetings. That's the good. I want them to start taking that granularity and thinking bigger. So there's, I guess the two components that we're really interested in is being able to articulate the dimension of what, uh, all the dimensions of this standards question and, and what should be being released. Um, based on these case studies and based on these awesome, the few awesome examples we have and a lot of the frustrations we have, and also thinking about what is the, not 101, but what's the way that we can articulate what we are all clued into for cities and towns and counties that are just on the cusp of understanding. Well, why go, why do you want to deeper in the county? Just because, uh, like, the definition of a city varies by city, mm -hmm. right? The definition of a village and town and all those things, you know, like, maybe they, all, they all seem like a relatively straightforward thing. They all, like, fundamentally vary powers and the things that they can do and how they work and what they mean, level of home rule and level of uh, you know homogeneity across all of, like there's something like the difference between a town and a city in New York is about whether or not like the degree of home rule and all towns follow the same set of laws and all cities can do whatever the hell they want. Cities over a million people, which is just New York City, so when upstate legislators are gonna screw New York City, they just pass laws about cities with more than a million people. Like oh. <laughs> so why why like not like why monitor in like the, the dream system, but why, why why focus on that super long tail? Mm -hmm. Why not say let's pick the top hundred cities and every county, for example, or like top five hundred cities and every like and then do every county where there is a little bit more uniformity in terms of what at least they are. Well, I have so many I have many different ways to answer that. I'm gonna choose my <laughs> answer in, in Connecticut, there are no county governments. There you go. So the county is just yeah. County I mean, so would we just skip uh, the state of Connecticut? Yeah. I, I guess but the basic thing for us is that there's no no government should be exempt from serving its people in a democracy, and so every government, 
the, the burden is scaled to the size of the government. And I think it's our kid gloves that we've put on to deal with local government that has left them in the state where they need to be dealt with with kid gloves. Um, to the broader point, we are charging like a bull at the very complexity that you highlighted because it is super complex and it is, I'm not going to stand here and lie, it's totally intimidating, but that's why we're standing here being overly honest because otherwise we'd just be lying. Um, the questions you're asking is one of the first things that we, that we wrote about was what's the population distribution among cities of different sizes in the U.S. and what are the different legal structures that they work under and how does home rule work in, 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 from state to state. And I think, frankly, one of the reasons that we didn't do what you suggested is that lots of people, when they think about approaching the scale of cities, may think of that, make that trade off and ignore small cities. And that suggested to us that if we don't do that, there's probably tons of things that we can address and find as opportunities that have just gone ignored because they're small and so it's probably hard. Can you pull up, um, so selectfoundation.com slash policy slash local. Just to answer, we made actually an infographic because we're like, oh my god, the long tail of cities is really yeah, I'm actually really curious to see If you that. scroll down, here it is, the third. Yeah, that one. exactly. Yeah. So, so we spent, before we started, and, and the reason why we're here now is because we spent a long time looking at home rule, thinking about state and local jurisdictions, because that might be one of the things that Sunlight can provide that hasn't totally been articulated yet, which is perhaps in the state of Alabama where there's no home rule, the best open data policies for cities are going to be passed at the state level. But if you're an advocate in Alabama and you're just throwing yourself at your city council, which you should be doing anyway to let people know that there's demand, perhaps there's another avenue for you that would actually be really effective. And, and maybe that's actually municipal data transparency then if you take that route. This, um, this is one of a few infographics, but just demonstrating that like the vast majority, and there's more if you scroll down, um, of cities are under 10,000, and this is an infographic of a like, disturbingly nice normal curve that comes out if you look at cities, which we use broadly for municipalities, um, under population of 500. So we've been kind of nerding out on this subject and are trying to branch outside also. The stat that's stuck in my head is that 80% of cities have under 10,000 people. But isn't that kind of deceptive, though? It's kind of like, let's say, like 90% of businesses or small businesses. Well, it's, 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 it's not like, deceptive. 95%. Small businesses, then you look at the actual employment distribution, it's not like remotely the case, right? Well, this is actually goes. The Atlantic City just did a great article on some misunderstood census data in a similar vein because they say that urban areas are growing, but an urban area includes third ring, fourth ring suburbs, so it doesn't actually talk about the urban center of the city itself, which is growing, but the rates look very different. If you're like, urban areas are exploding, or if you're like, oh, the city's population has been growing over time. Hmm. Yeah, I was just thinking, um, just an idea, and I don't know if I'm Maybe this is too vague, but maybe it's not. You know, a case study that we did in business school that I loved was about cell phone towers and about the first uh, cell phone towers and how they came to a, a cell phone tower standard that uh, could uh, track long distance calls. Mm -hmm. And it was a really, really interesting case. We heard an interview with the CEO that was the guy that um, uh, jumped in and founded the company that became the standard. And this guy sounded like Yosemite Sam. I mean, he was like, he sounded like a totally crazy Yahoo. But basically, he just jumped in and made a company <clears throat> and duct taped together uh, modems like on rolling chairs, literally, <laughs> and would push them around. And they'd have like, they had this crazy network, and things would go out, and they would just unplug a chair and wheel a new chair. <laughs> and, and, I mean, it was all like, shooting six shooters. I swear, I swear <laughs> God, and this is how the, this is how, like our long distance calls happen over 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 cell phones, and um, uh, but the thing that was really interesting is there's a town in Texas that would that was just oh and he charged, so he was able to do this because he beat the consortium of like AT and T and all these other companies that were getting together to come up with a standard, and um, he was charging municipalities just like ridiculous rates to be part of the club that could track this. And one town in Texas like stood up against them and said, this is stupid, we won't do it. You have terrible customer service, you're overcharging us, we won't do it. He said, fine, you can't have cell phones. And he never backed down on that company, down on that town. And they never they had like huge problems. And the, you know, the mayor like got fired, like, you know, like got voted out, which is how you get fired here. And the um, 
but so it kind of sorry about the long windedness of this, but it kind of gives me a, this idea. Like, what if you could somehow be a gatekeeper to funding? Like, what if you could help? This guy's a little, you know, like dastardly. But what if you could be maybe a little bit nicer even? What if you help people apply for funds and you became like a de facto standard? Like, hey, if you want to, if you want to be a restaurant that's applying for grants, you want your your municipality could submit this data in like this kind of standard XML JSON format, and this is this is what maybe you could help people do it at first, but then later on you could say, hey, this is you have to fall into like one of these ten categories or something like that. Like we need to know like number of cockroaches per longer. But I don't even know what the fields would be. But you know, being a gatekeeper is a really powerful way to or a facilitator or a connector. It's a powerful way to kind of uh, create a standard. That's a really interesting point. I, you know, I think it would be complicated for us to do that with um, municipal governments, just because we need, as a nonprofit, we have to kind of maintain ourselves within certain boundaries. Yeah. Um, to a broader point, though, I guess this is an opportunity to mention that one of the other portions of the work that we're doing is a startup accelerator, um, and we'll have more information about that out in May. So it's a not totally the same kind of standard setting gatekeeper, um, and I, I don't know if I use the gatekeeper and you can hear the same sentence willingly, but um, you know we are trying to think about people again outside of ourselves who are working on these issues and supporting where we can, and also again that's also why we don't want to write the best standards if you guys have done that already. We want to be able to broadcast that this is out there. Yeah. It's kind of a yeah, it was just that idea really. Yeah. Um, I think is a powerful idea, and I don't know how it could manifest itself, but I feel like there's, I feel like there's something there. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Uh, how far have you gotten into grantization? APIs, talk about metadata standards, anything that's general enough. You know, is there is there something is there guidance that you've gotten so far? On? So most of our APIs right now are about federal or state level data, but we're actually going through this huge process right now of improving our documentation broadly, and so that within the next, it, it'll definitely be by May. But what we're trying to do is they're already out there, they're already usable, you can already pick up and, and run with a lot of what we have. But we realize that there's a lot more we can. To, to broaden what you can build on top of our structures. So that's an awesome question that our team is actually working on. It's not a perfect answer, but at least it's coming soon. No, it might be. Another, another way to say it might be that, that our technical team has gotten involved in standards work, usually insofar as their work happens to create a de facto standard. So the legislative scraping and downloading and, and reconciliation work for the 50 states legislative scraping project Ended up creating a de facto standard for data sharing, and that so then people just started relying on it. Beyond that, I think they've been hesitant to, to try to get a standard there for right. broader standards. Work. Where are you on the requirement for electronic data filing? We support e filing. Um, we support it in terms of state governments, local governments, national government. We've uh, supported a lot of the what was called the Save the Data Bill and a number of other initiatives that. Kind of roll up e filing in general. Like we've been targeting the Senate for not doing it. Okay, what's the word support mean? Support. Support means you support legislation, legislative action to make that happen. And we've written legislation um, and we've supported in terms of like advocacy emails and sign on letters and such the efforts of others in that arena. All right, great. Well, thank, thank you guys. guys. Yeah. So now's the part where we kind of break off into the group. Before we do that, we kind of have to put up on the big board uh, what things people are working on. Chris, would you mind? So um, the first one, which I think Chris uh, mentioned, is uh, OpenGov 101. This is something we've been doing for the last uh, couple of weeks now. Uh, essentially, if you're new and you don't know what this whole OpenGov thing is, uh, or if like all of that is like, Ooh. Uh, Chris and probably Juan will be uh, uh, out. I guess I'm not sure where, but you guys will be running a little session uh, to sort of give a, a brief history and overview of that stuff. Is there maybe a raise of hands who's interested in, in doing that? Okay, so 
Okay, cool. So those are four or five. So uh, Chris is your guy for that. Um, as for other projects, um, I uh, I think I was going to we want to get a group together to talk about uh, uh, employment data for the state of Illinois. So if you guys are interested in that, we can, we can uh, form a group together. Um, any other projects people uh, are pulling around? Demon system. Oh, system. We're going to try to money ball education outcomes in Inglewood. Um, anybody interested in education data uh, at any level, from student level to like network at CPS level. Um, I'm happy to talk with you on that one. Anything else? You mentioned TIFF stuff for you were working on? Yeah, I didn't really like bring any breakout yeah. toys, okay. but maybe I'll come back next time. Okay. Sure. Yeah, or you, if you want to just share and like, have a group and talk to people are interested in TIFF stuff. There's a guy who's in a there's a guy who's in a tip layer on the night and he's got a layer on this core yeah, I was thinking of it. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Chris, are you doing anything? Yeah, the other the transportation guy, are you doing anything? No. Oh, you mean me? Yeah. Um yeah, I well I have a open source project for tracking and it works off of open trip plans, graphs. So it's basically like you have a street grid given by geometry, in this case backed by like GPS geometry. And you can like make this from an open street map or something like that. And then if you did GPS observations, it does it's a mixture model that asks whether you're on a road or off of a road, and it's a sequential Monte Carlo method. So it can estimate a bunch of things, like it'll estimate the GPS error, estimates like a, something akin to acceleration error, things like that. It's what's backing the uh, bus time stuff that's going on in New York. And I mean, the bus time itself is also open source, so Who's doing the bus time? Who's doing the bus time? Who's up here? Doing here? The bus acceleration is up here. Uh, oh, um, when we got here to meet him about three weeks ago, that he's pulling up. Yeah, that's right. The yes. MTA's project, the bus time one for New York. So yeah, it offers like something like arrival times for buses, but it's an open source project. The he was he was putting in this bus route here. There's a there's some there's a group set of data that. City release, uh, which is, I guess, as well as congestion uh, yeah. speed. That's using buses to sort of figure out how sort of like what the speed of different streets are. So it's not necessarily about tracking buses, it's about sort of seeing traffic patterns. Yeah, so what goes on in bus time, um, yeah, you can get arrival kind of information and stuff. And it's open source, so it's backed by one bus away. And we've been working with other people. <laughs> From around the world to get the sort of inference we're using into that. So, if anyone's interested in those kind of things, check out the bus time sites on GitHub. Um, my tracking project's on there as well. There's a couple of you guys from OpenStreetMap. Um, did you guys have a plan for the, did you have like some task sort of things you wanted to get together for the OpenStreetMap group? Or just, I think Ian Bees is the one who's kind of put together. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's not related to Okay. Um, yeah, so if, yeah, if maybe you guys want to have a little group for a street map, if anybody's interested in that stuff. Um, I do know that uh, a couple weeks ago, Tom Shank announced that the city's released all of their building footprints and streets and bike racks and bike paths completely open source. So now it's basically like a green light to import it into open street map. Yeah. Uh, that's something that Ian was kind of spearheading, so I don't know. Helping them with, or something like that. He actually didn't have the city last year. Yeah, yeah he year. stopped. Yeah, he stopped halfway through. Yeah. It's not that we didn't have the right, but that we didn't have the like, traditional right. Uh, the right. city could theoretically take, take the right. right. Yeah. Uh, that's but this, yeah, so the new today is now released without that. Without that clause. Yeah. It says probably by the end of March is going to be done. Oh, awesome. That's great. Yay, we'll see you then.
any other projects? Bo, or you guys, did you want to have a little <coughs> about the CIF or your student projects or anything like that? Well, we could, but we don't want to. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Oh yeah, DDU. Who's interested? Mm -hmm. Anybody interested in that thing I that thing I mentioned? You do? Uh, yeah, we get a little group together and uh, and uh, get that set up. Um, I know there's a couple of people we meet uh, who are outside the room who have already uh, done it, so they can help do that as well. Uh, and be too to uh, Okay, great. Well, uh, yeah, feel free to. Uh, need more pizza, uh, hang out in here. The main area uh, where you guys walked in, that's also free to use. If you guys want to kind of break off and have a little bit more uh, quiet, um, yeah. But, uh, thanks, for, thanks for coming. The civic hacking one-on-one -on -one will be by the couches. And I'll be there shortly. I've got to turn off the light team. <laughs> All right, cool. Sorry. Okay, so that concludes our broadcast. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, this should be on YouTube, sort of cleaned up and a little bit neater later. And good night and good luck.